Hola, hola. Bienvenidos a un nuevo capítulo de Insights, una serie sobre ciencia, salud y bienestar. El día de hoy, nuestro invitado, el doctor Fred Schaffer, nos va a hablar sobre un concepto que ha cobrado mucha importancia en los últimos años, que es la variabilidad de la frecuencia cardíaca. Este es un parámetro que describe la influencia de distintos ritmos biológicos sobre el corazón y que termina reflejándose en el tiempo que pasa entre cada latido. Los invito a que con el doctor Fred Schaffer eh, platiquemos más sobre este concepto para que vayan viendo la importancia y relevancia que tiene para la salud. Claro que antes los invito a suscribirse al canal, a darle a la campanita y preparar todas las preguntas que les surjan para que nos las pongan en los comentarios. Vamos a la entrevista y nos vemos en un rato. Hi guys, welcome again to Insights, where we talk with several experts from around the globe about health-related issues. On today's episode, we have Dr. Frederick Schaffer who is a biological psychologist and professor of psychology, as well as former department chair at Truman State University, where he has taught since 1975 and has served as director of Truman's Center for Applied Psychophysiology since 1977. In 2008, he received the Walker and Doris Allen Fellowship for Faculty Excellence, In 2013, he received the Truman State University Outstanding Research Mentor of the Year Award. In 2010, he received the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback Distinguished Scientist Award. Dr. Schaffer was the principal co-editor of Evidence-Based Practice in Biofeedback and Neurofeedback, the third edition, His research focuses on techniques to increase heart rate variability. Dr. Schaffer is a BCIA senior diplomate in biofeedback and HIV biofeedback. He is the past chair and current treasurer of the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance and AAPB president-elect. So, Fred, I'm very excited and, and very grateful that you agreed to this talk. How are you? I'm doing great. Uh, just to meet a new professional, uh, new to me, uh, certainly not to your society, but new to me is wonderful. And the opportunity to talk about things we care about is uh, so uh, amazing. And thank you for providing this opportunity for me to reach uh, your audience. No, no, thank you. And, and I think Uh, the audience will be very impressed with what you have to to tell us about uh, heart activity and how it is related to mental health, to physical mm -hmm. health. Uh, I, I don't think it is a very known fact. Well, let's begin to get the word out. Hey, so uh, the title of the talk is a healthy heart is not a metronome in your own words. Could you tell us what do you mean by that? I am glad you asked. The, that catchphrase uh, was invented to counter a myth that many lay people have about what is healthy heart rate activity. Many lay people believe that a healthy heart is a steady heart. And so if your heart beat at 75 beats per minute, beat by beat, that would seem to show uh, amazing health, except it either is a heart that needs a pacemaker or one that is on a pacemaker. Uh, so I try to sneak that phrase into most of the articles I write about HRV because I think of it as uh, so important. Uh, the reality is 
that we need heart rate to change as our uh, challenges change. Uh, let me give you an example. Imagine that you are laying on a couch and binge watching uh, a soap opera or drama, and then you get up uh, to uh, go to the refrigerator. Uh, that requires that your cardiovascular system and respiratory system uh, change their game because you now have a more demanding uh, workload. Therefore, heart rate has to increase, uh, just as breathing may have to increase. Now, heart rate variability is the organized change over uh, time of the time between one heartbeat and the next and the next and the next. And when you uh, change it up more by having 75, 60 beats per minute, 55, 85, that change, that variability increases your ability to adjust to new physical or even cognitive uh, workloads. And so it gives us greater capacity uh, to cope with challenges. Of course, it, it is not reasonable to think that one uh, set point is suitable for every kind of activity or every kind of states that you go through, right? Absolutely. Uh, and naturally, as you are, say, on a treadmill, and in the background you can see uh, part of a treadmill and elliptical machine that rarely see any use in my house. But if I were to go on the treadmill, you assume that it would be very helpful for my heart rate and respiration rate to increase as I make the rate or the uh, or perhaps the angle more, the grade more challenging. Uh, now, it's important to make a distinction between heart rate and heart rate variability. Oh, heart rate is the number of times my heart beats per minute. And ideally, under resting conditions, it would not be nice to have it relatively low. Uh, if I were a marathon runner, it might be in the 40s or 50s. Uh, it would be bad for it to at rest to be very high because when that happens, heart rate variability tends to be minuscule. Uh, it tends to be greatly uh, depressed. Uh, so we hope for people to perhaps achieve good fitness uh, through exercise, walks, and other things so that they can have lower resting heart rates and higher resting heart rate variability. But there's an inverse relationship between heart rate and heart rate variability. Yes, and I think that that is the, the source of, of the confusion or of thinking that uh, the heart always uh, beats at the same rhythm, right? Because people, I think, assume that because we're talking about an average heart rate of uh, mm. 60 beats per minute, that then the intervals between heartbeats must be mm. identical, right? Yeah. And the reality is they shouldn't be. And uh, when I think about when I try to explain heart rate variability, one of the things I will focus on is breathing. And let me just use that as an example. We know that in people who are healthy uh, and typically younger, that as they inhale, heart rate speeds. As they exhale, heart rate slows. And this happens with each breathing cycle. Now, this phenomenon has a scary sounding scientific name. It sounds almost like a disease, respiratory sinus 
arrhythmia, uh, or if we're being merciful, RSA. But RSA, when it happens, shows us that, in fact, the heart rate uh, should change, not just over time, but with every breath. And when we don't see this change, the speeding and slowing of the heart during breathing, it suggests that the individual may not be as healthy and fit as, the, as they might want to be. Yes. Uh, what, what would be the neural or, or biological mechanisms that synchronize these two oscillations? Uh, namely uh, heart rate and breathing? Well, that's an interesting thing. Uh, heart rate variability when measured over short periods of time, like say three minutes, five minutes, mm -hmm. is really driven by two parasympathetic factors. So, and let me unpack parasympathetic for a second. This is the branch of the autonomic nervous system that uh, conserves energy. This is the branch that uh, allows us to rest and digest. Uh, it is the branch that uh, unfortunately is activated when we face inescapable threats. Uh, so imagine that you are a mouse in the jaws of a cat, which is not a pleasant thing to think about. Of course. Uh, the very best strategy for the mouse is to play dead, is to freeze. Uh, and in humans, the, the corollary is PTSD with dissociation, so post-traumatic stress disorder. So the parasympathetic system also does that. It also allows us to survive in impossible situations. And we use the parasympathetic system whenever we engage in self-regulation. So whether we use mindfulness meditation uh, yoga, mm -hmm. neurofeedback, uh, or even prayer. In all these cases, we are mobilizing part of our parasympathetic system. So when I, that's, when I use the word parasympathetic, it means a lot of things. Uh, but uh, clearly now saying that these sources are parasympathetic for heart rate variability, uh, I'm referring really to two things. First and uh, foremost, I am referring to respiratory sinus arrhythmia, RSA, the yeah. changes that occur with breathing. I'm also talking about the blood pressure regulation system that we call the baroreceptor reflex uh, that is driven by our breathing rate. So when we teach clients to uh, practice slow paced breathing, perhaps from somewhere between four and a half and seven and a half breaths per minute, it is trying to increase the RSA or the swings in heart rate, which in turn is going to uh, act on the baroreceptor reflex uh, to uh, increase the variability in the heart. Yeah, and uh, in line with what you just explained us, I. I was thinking about how uh, underrated, at least, well, I think for, for most people, breathing actually is. 
when I when I work with a with a client and I am able to show them how heart rate varies as a function of their respiration, they are like uh, amazed to actually see that breathing does have an impact on other physiological parameters, right? Oh, uh, yes. However, yeah. Oh, however, most uh, clinicians don't work with biofeedback equipment and don't have like this opportunity to to show people how breathing is actually influencing other other systems. You know, there are workarounds for that. Uh, there are smartphones uh, and smart watches that provide you with the ability to track heart rate uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Uh, uh, but I think that let's, let's stop for a second and talk about what you just said about breathing being underrated. Uh, breathing is a very powerful tool. And many of, uh, of my colleagues' clients uh, will enter uh, either coaching or uh, clinical uh, sessions with what we call dysfunctional breathing. Uh, there are many uh, dysfunctional breathing behaviors. One of the most common, uh, and from my colleague, uh, Dr. Ina Khazan from Harvard Medical, uh, and also from our colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Pepper from San Francisco State University, uh, is overbreathing. In overbreathing, the person uh, expels too much CO2. And so, and it can be done in very subtle, non dramatic ways. Uh, they can uh, engage in sighs, they can yawn, they can gasp, uh, they can take deeper breaths than they possibly will use. And all of these blow off, expel too much CO2, carbon dioxide. And so often over-breathing is a breathing behavior we have to correct for training to be successful. Uh, and it happens more subtly than hyperventilation or than a panic attack. Uh, they won't even know that they're doing it. The people around them won't think this is an emergency because it can be so silent. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not as a an intense subjective experience is actually hyperventilating mm -hmm. but it but it does grow over time right yeah. yes and they're doing it throughout most of the day that is the way they breathe uh, it included packed into over breathing at times is breath holding now you may notice that i don't have to stop for breath as i chat with you that's because I've synchronized my breathing with my talking, something that professors have to learn to do or else yeah. they might faint at the podium. Uh, so, so over breathing is one breathing problem that needs to be addressed because it can produce so many of the symptoms that may be seen in a doctor's office or a clinical psychologist or a counselor's office. I mean, chest pain, dizziness, lightheadedness, uh, a kind of brain fog, all of these can be due to overbreathing and can interfere with a person's uh, quality of life. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I think people are not used to hearing that some sort of level of carbon dioxide is actually necessary uh, to maintain a correct 
pH uh, or acidity in the blood or to yes. even to to the liver oxygen correctly, right? Right. All right. Ina, uh, in her uh, in a wonderful book that she has published in the last year uh, in uh, biofeedback, uh, and I have it. Now, you understand that I am not going to talk about any of my own products or things, uh, but I'm not at all shy about bragging on Ina. This is by feedback and mindfulness in everyday life. Uh, Ina talks very, uh, very eloquently about how we don't need more oxygen. It's one of those myths, just as you need to have a steady heartbeat is a myth. You need more oxygen is another myth. We actually only use about a quarter of the oxygen we take in with each breath. We blow out a good chunk of it because we don't need it. What we do need is to conserve about 80% of the carbon dioxide that we take yeah. with each breath. And I'm about to tell your audience why. And I'm going to try to do it in a way that doesn't take us uh, too deep into the weeds. You alluded to that just a moment ago when you talked about the pH, the power of hydrogen, the acidity, the uh, basicness of uh, the blood. When you blow off too much CO2, when you expel too much CO2, perhaps by taking very large breaths, it changes the pH in a way that prevents hemoglobin in the blood from releasing oxygen and nitric oxide to tissue. So when uh, you blow off too much CO2, the uh, hemoglobin holds on to the oxygen and nitric oxide for dear life and doesn't readily release it. And let me tell you what that means. If oxygen doesn't get to the tissue, uh, you have the uh, symptoms of hypoxia, of uh, not asphyxiation, but you are oxygen deprived. If nitric oxide isn't released, the blood vessels, especially blood vessels to your brain, do not dilate. And therefore, nutrients and fuels like uh, glucose do not get to your brain. And so your brain uh, does experience what we could describe as being fogged. Yeah. At, the, at the same time, the blood vessels in your fingers are now more uh, closed, and therefore your hands and toes uh, may be cold. So those are just some of the reasons that it's important to uh, at least conserve 80% of your carbon dioxide. Yeah, um, uh, I mean, I, I think this is very informative and, and that this will bring a whole new other way of thinking about carbon dioxide to, to people. And, uh, talking about heart rate variability, how is overbreeding or how can overbreeding impact heart rate variability? Often people who overbreathe are breathing uh, too rapidly. Mm -hmm. And breathing too rapidly, typically they breathe shallowly and rapidly. Now, the rapid doesn't have to be uh, like 25 breaths per minute. It could be 18 or 20. So it's nowhere near what we usually think of uh, as hyperventilation uh, or a panic attack. But as you, 
as you breathe more rapidly, you lose the ability to synchronize your breathing with the barrel reflex. Now, the, for most individuals, the ideal rate of breathing, if you want to produce the largest swings in heart rate with each breathing cycle, is somewhere between four and a half and maybe upwards of seven and a half breaths per minute. So let's suppose that your ideal uh, rate of stimulation uh, is six, uh, six breaths a minute, or mm -hmm. six muscle contractions of the hands and feet per minute. If you're doing it instead at 18, you're so outside your ideal range that you're not going to produce the resonance effects that can be produced by breathing. So we need to synchronize breathing with changes in heart rate. And that needs to be at, the, at your ideal rate. And that rate will range somewhere between four and a half and seven and a half breaths per minute for adults. Uh, and if you're breathing too rapidly, you can't synchronize them up and breathing will not uh, increase heart rate variability. Let me give you an analogy. And this is one I stole from uh, Dr. Kazan again. She and I uh, and Don Moss uh, teach together frequently for BCIA and AAPB. Uh, Ina talks about how you have a child on a swing and there's a perfect time as the swing draws back to push the child on the swing to produce the highest arc and the most squeals in the child, the most enjoyment. So there is an ideal rate of breathing or contracting your muscles that will produce the largest changes in heart rate variability. So that's the relationship between breathing rate and heart rate variability. That when you overbreathe, you're so far out of that range. So if your ideal frequency was six, but now you're breathing at three times that at 18, uh, your breathing is not going to amplify the swings in heart rate and blood pressure. Yes. And uh, in order for a person to know their uh, ideal breathing rate, how can, they, how can they learn which one it is? It all depends on the resources you have on hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I were to uh, channel for uh, Dr. Leah Lagos, uh, who is who uh, came out of Paul Lair's laboratory at Rutgers University and who is in private clinical practice, especially with athletes who have sustained head injuries. I would say the breathing rate that is most comfortable within that range of, say, uh, four and a half to seven and a half is very likely to be uh, at least close to what is ideal for you. Now, if you are using uh, equipment made by the Institute of Heart Math, uh, and so I'm talking about inner balance or uh, M-Wave desktop, the breathing rate that produces, and I'm using their term, which is not a formal uh, applied psychophysiology term, coherence. So coherence is a special term that they use. The breathing rate that produces the greatest coherence for you 
is likely to be your be at your resonance frequency. Uh, if you're in my lab, uh, where we can monitor many aspects of heart rate variability using an EKG or ECG, uh, it would I would look at which breathing rate uh, increases the majority or the most important of these measurements. So there are many ways to do it. It all depends on the resources you have. Uh, what is clear is that it's going to, for the majority of people, fall within that four and a half and seven and a half breath per minute range. And it may not make a great deal of difference if you train in the absence of this equipment, you just train at six breaths per minute. Awesome. If, even though, for example, one person doesn't know their exact uh, resonance frequency, which is, uh, I, I, I think we have not uh, mentioned the term. I don't yes. know. Well, uh, even though one person doesn't know the exact rate, is uh -huh. it a safe bet to advise to them to just download a breathing pacer and maybe yes. set it around six breaths per minute? Mm -hmm and start practicing this on a regular basis? Yes, yes. Uh, I believe that there, there are so many free breathing pacers available, and they are, they're so easy to use. And yes, you know, I think the first, to back up for a second, the first thing you want to do is make sure they're breathing correctly. And correctly here means uh, that uh, you're uh, using, you're making greater use of your diaphragm. So instead of in the chest thoracic breathing, you are letting the diaphragm do most of the work. It should be using Eric Pepper's language. It should feel effortless, uh, it should be nice and uh, if we were graphing it using uh, a flexible band we call a respirometer, the tracing would be smooth. It'd be like ocean waves, so it'd be uh, smooth and continuous. Uh, Eric would also say that you will want to exhale longer then you inhale. How much longer really depends on you, uh, but that you may have better results uh, exhaling slightly longer uh, than if you were going one-to-one uh, -one where you inhale only as long as you exhale. So Eric prefers a longer exhalation, so does Ina. If it were appropriate for the individual, uh, inhaling through the nose to filter and moisten and heat the air and exhale potentially through uh, the mouth with lips pursed so that you can get more sensory feedback. Uh, and of course if your nose is uh, clogged up because of sinuses uh, then you have to breathe through your mouth. Uh, but those are some, a few. I mean, Eric Pepper would unpack it further and say, first, wear clothes that allow the free movement of the tummy. He'd say, choose a posture that supports good breathing. Uh, so a good upright posture, uh, good spinal support. So those are some of the things that he'd insist on. And then after we have the basics down, go to a pacer. But it okay. makes no sense to breathe at six breaths a minute if you're doing awful breathing. Of course. So, or dysfunctional breathing. 
So if we think about it uh, stepwise, people should first address their, their breathing patterns, make sure they are using the correct muscles. Yes. And only after correcting maybe this kind of, of issues, move yes. to the use of a pacer. Yes, yes. And ideally, you know, Eric emphasizes effortlessness. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses a wonderful expression within uh, the German language and translated into English is my body breathes itself. My body breathes itself. Uh, the idea here is uh, to use what we would call passive volition. Passive volition is the approach where we allow rather than force. So we allow our body, we encourage our body to breathe a certain way. We don't order it around. Yes, and, and sometimes this is, uh, I mean, this is contrary to what people actually try to write or actually do, which is trying to get an active control or an, uh, an effortful control of yes. regulation, right? It's a paradox. To control, yeah. you have to let go of control. To control, you have to trust uh, your body. You have to trust that this is a skill you can learn and doesn't require your uh, micromanagement. Let me give you an example. Uh, there was a time when I drove a stick shift uh, in the United States. And so you have to shift to the next gear. Now, you could actually make a mistake if you paid too much attention to it. So I trusted myself to be able to automatically make the shift and manipulate, press on the clutch when I needed to. Too much over attention to it, too much self uh, ordering around is just going to uh, uh, grind the gears. So you have to put your body on automatic once you've learn the basics yeah yeah of course it's it's like trying to or to make a people a, a person sorry uh consciously think about how they are walking right yes. and uh it it will make walking the hardest thing for sure if they have to think everything and every muscle they do and how they shift their weight from leg to leg in 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 order to make the motion Yes. And so what we're really saying is uh, stealing a uh, advertising slogan from uh, the brand Nike, uh, and which is just do it. Just do it, right. <laughs> yeah. And how, how does HRV then uh, correlate with, uh, with certain diseases? I mean, is it more of a, uh, of a correlate of psychological health or a physical health, which are really shouldn't be separated, but that's, that's how people yes. often see it? Yes. What we know is that uh, low heart rate variability is associated with uh, illness and uh, a poor performance. Now, before we use measurements, it's important to realize that s some of our best data come from 24-hour measurements where we have monitored the person continuously. And it's never a good idea to apply uh, average values that were obtained with 24-hour recordings uh, when in fact all you have is five, uh, five minutes of data. Uh, this is what I think is true. I think that when you have lower HRV, 
Uh, and let me ground this for a second, because most of your audience doesn't work with HRV. And so if I talk about some of the metrics, I'll be speaking not only in English, but in uh, Greek uh, or uh, yeah. something that's equally impenetrable. Let's just think about changing the heart rate across the breathing cycle. Imagine that I have an unhealthy heart. As I look across the breathing cycle, across inhaling and exhaling, I might not see any change in heart rate. It may start out at inhalation at 75 uh, beats per minute, and at the end of exhalation, still be 75. There's no change. Uh, so when you have uh, reduced or non-existent HRV, uh, it potentially means that you have a greater risk of uh, disease. And we see this in patients who are older. Uh, it goes down every decade uh, uh, after about age 50 or so. Uh, but you see it in uh, patients with heart disease, high blood pressure. You see it with anxiety disorder, panic, depression. Uh, and we know that when we can restore heart rate variability by using a, a technique like paced breathing with or without uh, heart rate variability by a feedback, that uh, health may improve, symptoms may get better, and performance may improve. Yes, because I think uh, at this point, people might find the fact that, well, the brain integrates uh, several kinds of information to control heart rate, but maybe they, they haven't uh, understand the fact that the heart also communicates to the brain and that there, are, that there is a pathway from the heart to the brain that may also influence performance and cognitive function, right? Yes, yes. Uh, this is, you know, we're now diving into what is called neurocardiology. It has many names. And the idea here is that there are reciprocal connections between the heart and the brain. So the heart talks to the brain, the brain talks to the heart. Uh, and in fact, there are more sensory fibers from going from the heart to the brain than from any other body organ and the brain. Uh, we know that we can detect a heartbeat evoked uh, potential uh, in the EEG. So it is tied to uh, the heart. It is, and in fact, uh, when you experience uh, either what we think of as enjoyable emotions like joy or happiness uh, or more challenging emotions like anger or fear, that this reduces uh, the heartbeat evoked uh, potential. Uh, so we, we know that there is it, the heart talks to the brain and the brain talks to the heart. And we also know that uh, within the chest cavity and uh, scattered about the heart are networks of neurons so that we can talk about uh, a cardiac nervous system. Uh, and so uh, there is, just as the uh, system that regulates the gut, the enteric branch of the autonomic nervous system, uh, consists of about 150 million neurons. Uh, you have a similar network that helps to regulate the activity of the heart and that communicates with the brain. Yeah. Yeah, and the whole, the whole field of, of neurocardiology, well, I, I find it fascinating. But I, I think you have given us a, a quick glance of what HRV is, why a healthy heart should not be uh, beating 
at a steady state. And just uh, as, as a final question, so uh, I wouldn't want to take a lot of your time, which you, you kindly. <laughs> oh, it's been my joy. Yes. I'm yeah. having fun. Yeah, I, I, I'm having a lot of fun hearing you and, and it's pretty interesting. How can other health professionals, uh, I mean, other than biofeedback providers, such as psychotherapists, um, maybe nutritionists or uh, physical therapists, uh, benefit from this concept and apply it into their practice without actually uh, being psychophysiologists? Most of the people uh, in the United States who uh, utilize uh, heart rate variability are not uh, physiologists, they're not researchers. Uh, they might be uh, counselors, or they could be clinicians, but they uh, did not spend a career learning about applied psychophysiology. Uh, as with many new uh, procedures, uh, I would suggest they start with uh, your insights. I would suggest they attend workshops by people who are not vendors with a commercial interest. Uh, I would suggest that they uh, take advantage of the uh, presentations available by organizations like uh, the Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback, as well as the uh, Neurofeedback Organization, ISNR. I mean, there are, are now with the pandemic, we see a move to uh, hybrid meetings and virtual meetings, which will make uh, these talks more available and yeah. also more affordable. So start with the science, uh, as well as the clinical wisdom from my colleagues like uh, Ina Hazan and Dick Gewurz and uh, certainly uh, Eric Pepper and Don Moss, start with uh, presentations by clinicians who are used to explaining uh, how to implement these skills to people who are just beginning. Yeah. So start with these presentations uh, and uh, then uh, perhaps they'll give you the courage and foundation to begin to practice yourself. So before, before you train someone to breathe, it's important to practice uh, and to uh, take care of your own breathing mechanics. And then you can uh, teach it to other people. And again, to channel for Eric, I've taught with Eric for years uh, and taken workshops from Eric originally. Uh, you as a uh, practitioner are always a model. You are always on stage. Pe your clients are always watching you. And so that's why it's so important that when you want to teach breathing, that you are breathing uh, in an effortless, functional way yourself, so you're not telling them one thing and doing the other. Of course. Uh, so you do all that, you become self-experienced in uh, what we call, could call healthy breathing, and then you teach it using tools like uh, a pacer. Yeah. Yeah, and since the phenomenological experience is so important to yes. to actually uh, learn the, the self-regulation processes, mm -hmm. it's always better to understand uh, yourself, how, how it feels, how it works, and what benefits it has in yes. order to be able to transmit it. My uh, dear colleague, Don Moss, who is a licensed clinical psychologist has freakishly warm 
hands. And I asked Don uh, on stage during probably a HRV workshop, Don, why do you have freakishly warm hands? And his answer was, well, Fred, I work with children as part of, of the clients I see. And if you work with kids, they're very likely to ask, you show me that your hands are as warm as you are asking me to uh, achieve. And so he had to practice yeah. to be able to be a credible model. Of course. And so that answers the question that many people have asked, why does Don Moss have such freakishly warm hands? It's because he's practiced and he is a very skilled uh, self-regulator. Well, that's 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 amazing, and and it even uh, I think the the practice effects mm -hmm. add on add, uh, add to each other. Yes, and so so the body learns to be uh, on certain level uh, for itself. I mean, on a baseline, of course, if you yes. have. To, uh, if you have to engage in some physical activity, then the body will have to to respond. Yes, yes. But yes. So you you need to practice. Practice makes you credible as a model. And even when we don't think the camera is on, it is on the client. Yeah. And again, people pay attention to what a practitioner does far more so than what the practitioner says. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's great advice and you have provided us with some guidelines, uh, both for, for clinicians that want to maybe start to learn about HRV, as well as for, as for everyone in order to be mm -hmm. Uh, to train a little bit, to focus on their breath and how it may impact mm -hmm. their daily life. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Fred. Uh, I am very honored for, for having spent this last minutes talking to you and very grateful that you could teach us a little bit more about what HIV is. My pleasure. Thank you for the privilege of reaching out to uh, your audience and the pleasure of your company, Mauricio. Thank you too. Pues, muchas gracias por haber llegado hasta el final de la entrevista. Espero que la hayan disfrutado y que hayan aprendido mucho. Y sobre todo que hayan visto o que vaya quedando más clara la relación que hay entre lo que pensamos, lo que sentimos, lo que hacemos y el estado de nuestro cuerpo, eh, con el fin claro de, de que pues, vayamos generando esta conciencia sobre, sobre el impacto que tienen las decisiones que tomamos a diario con respecto a nuestro estilo de vida. Eh, los invito a checar las redes sociales que tienen en la descripción, les dejo también algunos links a, a algunos proyectos y libros del Dr. Schaffer por si son de su interés. Eh, recuerden suscribirse y nos vemos en el siguiente capítulo. Bye.